the record button. And I'll pin you if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I am Lee Merriweather, a volunteer for AARP in Houston. AARP is the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. AARP Houston is proud to sponsor Mindful Mondays, a caregiver series in partnership with Caregiver Wellness Retreat. With over 3.4 million caregivers in Texas, AARP is dedicated to providing resources and information to those caring for a loved one or a friend. Prepare to Care resource guides are available to download and they are designed to help develop and implement a caregiving plan. The guide includes information on how to have vital conversations, ways to assess your loved one's needs, tips for organizing essential documents, a roundup of federal and national resources, information on caring for yourself, checklists, medication charts, and contact lists. Visit aarp.org forward slash caregiving to download your guide today. You can also visit aarp.org forward slash Houston for more virtual events and resources in your community. I will put the links and information in the chat. We can be found on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter at AARP Texas. Again, thank you for joining us today. Can't hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Always helpful when Zoom uh, does what you ask it to. <laughs> All right. So Lee, thank you uh, for being my partner in this series. This is the sixth of our six week series. And so I am so grateful um, to have the sponsorship of AARP. It enables the small nonprofits like us to be able to do and offer all of these resources to caregivers at no cost. And it is a really um, powerful tool for us to connect with you, especially in this time of um, not being able to do all of the things that we're used to, but I think, um, one of my favorite phrases that I've used quite a bit is silver lining it. If I had to, this has been one of them that we, um, wherever you are in your journey, or if you're in a caregiving journey, um, that we are able to kind of even just grab a, a cup of coffee and enjoy lunch and be able to explore these mindfulness tools together so that we're just a little more resilient, I hope. And so today I'll give you a little menu. Uh, we are, if you've joined us before, you know that I tend to do a lot of experiential um, and that my hope is that um, you can kind of take it like a buffet. Uh, hopefully one of these practices will really resonate with you and that you will continue to kind of put that in your back pocket to implement over the coming weeks and months. And I've asked, uh, as you're joining us today, uh, if you can put your where you're zooming in from, and maybe kind of where you are emotionally today, what you're what you're feeling or experiencing. And some have put sadness, and others have just um, uh, feeling blessed. Some of the comments. So if you have a moment to add that, if you are joining us live, I'll encourage you to share that through the chat box. If at any point you have a question or like you couldn't hear me earlier, please unmute <laughs> and let me know. Uh, that is one reason that we do uh, this in a meeting version because um, connection is something that I truly value. So I'm excited that you have chosen to be with us today. And so I do have a suggestion and a gentle request. If you have the opportunity to kind of tune down or um, allow this time to be sacred in some way. And so that might mean closing a door. It might mean turning off 
your phone. <laughs> it might mean closing some of the windows that are on whatever device it is that you are um, watching this on today. Um, so whatever, whatever it is or whatever you need to do to allow yourself to really arrive. And in fact, we'll do that together now just by taking a simple exhale. So breathing in through your nose and then allowing yourself to just simply follow your exhale for as long as you can. So just noticing your exhale. And this time as you breathe in, notice where the inhale goes in your body. Does it go all up here or can you allow the breath to go a little deeper? And then exhale all the way out. Good. And let's do that again one more time. So just breathing in normal, not forcing it, noticing maybe where the air goes. And then as you exhale, imagine it just releasing all the way down into the ground. Good. And now take a moment to notice how you feel now after taking those few breaths. If there's any change or shift, or even noticing if it feels exactly the same. And that's okay. So our hope today is that each time that we do these different practices, that you're able to kind of take a gauge of how you're experiencing things in your body right now. And then is there a shift? Sometimes there's no shift and that's okay. It's all about the noticing and being curious about it. And then if you're able to notice a subtle change, that can be really powerful and it could be a catalyst for the next moment and the next moment. So I'll be showing my screen back and forth and we'll be doing some experiential things. And I certainly appreciate Lee this morning uh, staying on top of uh, admitting people. <laughs> so uh, we're, uh, we're growing just a little bit this morning. So noticing today, maybe what's in our body, and I asked you to kind of notice, is there anxiousness, is there sadness, or is there joy? Um, what's arriving for you today? And so when we experience anxiousness or anxiety, which is what our topic is today, we often don't even ask that question. So something can trigger this emotion or this this feeling really of anxiousness in our bodies, but we don't pause often to notice what else is coming up, what other symptoms are arriving. And so I'll share my screen here in just a second. Takes a couple of clicks, so I appreciate that. All right. Oh, see there, I pulled up some AARP for us. <laughs> uh, all right. So hang on just a second. So we'll just start out this morning just with another example of mindfulness. And, and it's one of my go-to tools in terms of anxiety. And so when um, I'm going to go ahead and admit those. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so when we, we are exploring mindfulness and this idea of mindfulness and the simple definition is that ability to notice or become aware of something, allowing there to be a pause. So rather than reacting we have the agency to act and hopefully in a non-judgmental way. And so when, when that is present in our awareness, then we have some more coping tools and coping mechanisms for that. So one of my favorite mindfulness tools for anxiety is what I would call an anchor. And so that is, we'll actually repeat this in several different ways throughout our practice together today. And so an anchor is really a part of noticing. We can choose something to anchor our attention toward. And you can even, you can metaphorically think of it as an actual physical weight or an anchor as if you sort of just dropped it in the water and let it float down 
onto the bottom of the ocean and letting your attention reside there. An anchor can be a little more tangible. It could be something that you look at. So if you took your eyes just slightly off the screen and you were to notice something in your surroundings that is either beautiful, something that calls your attention, such as a particular color, or something perhaps that is soothing for you. And for me, it's the window that's in front of me and the green and the greenery. So I tend to anchor my attention there, allowing myself to focus on how the breeze and the leaves and the motion of that is very calming. And so as I allow myself to focus on that, I can notice changes happen happening physiologically. So we'll find an anchor point visually. So go ahead and take the eyes slightly off the screen and allow yourself to just focus in that direction for a moment. Breathing in and breathing out. So whatever your attention is resting on in this moment, Notice if that has a particular shape, color, texture. And notice how that makes you feel. Is there a sense of calm? And if you were to close your eyes, could you still see that? And it does it still have that sort of internal calm that it brings about? Allow yourself to just exhale fully. And then you can bring your attention back. So as you bring your attention back, can you still resurrect that sense? Can you picture it still in your mind's eye? I've probably shared this before, but I used to do this little trick when I was a kid. And, and that little trick was uh, being able to picture something. And when I was feeling really anxious, it allowed me to create a sense of calm and ease. As an adult, I do the same thing, but I'll picture the mountains. And when I see those mountains in my mind's eye, it has this wave over me, this, this sense of grounding, this strong, powerful, majestic thing. And I can picture myself that same way, strong, majestic, and it has like just that calming sense or wave. So noticing how it makes you feel and noticing what part of your body is physiologically changed just by anchoring or tethering to that something that allows you to feel a sense of calm and ease. There you go, Lee, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna share my screen again. All right. Let's see, hang on just a second. Oh, technology today, I tell you. There we go, all right. And one more time, there we are. So anxiety, a really simple definition is the feeling of fear or worry that is typically associated with situations of uncertainty, specifically in an uncertain outcome. Whew. And I, this really got me this morning, this remembrance of anxiety is at its worst when there is an intolerance for uncertainty. Another way to frame that is this desire to control the uncontrollable. Yeah. <laughs> so when we have this intolerance for this anxiousness or this anxious feeling that builds up inside of us, 
there often are some consequences. And so those can result in things of this feeling of dread or uneasiness. It can show up in, as symptoms in our body, the feelings of nervousness, restlessness, or tension, um, sort of that impending doom feeling, um, that idea of feeling um, shaky, maybe even weak or tired. Um, it can often present itself as um, this constant worry or rumination it can also be the opposite and avoidance, but physiologically it comes out as a rapid heart rate, so maybe sweating or trembling, um, breath changes. It could even be a sense of hyper, um, hyperventilation. And so when we notice these things, remember that anxiety and anxiousness can be both good and bad stress, right? So if we think of stress as neither good nor bad, but it is our response to that stress, which can have positive or negative consequences. I love this quote by Elizabeth Gilder, Gilbert, you're afraid of surrender because you don't want to lose control, but you never had control. All you had was anxiety. And so when we try to sort of wrestle a lightning bolt or control a storm, anxiety can really tend to pick up, right? So when we're, ha in, when we're plunked into a situation in which there is no control, stress usually arrives, right? There is good stress. There is the stress that um, allows us to perform a creative action, creative problem solving, a sense of a solution, and is generally surrounded by healthy or positive, those um, attributes or consequences of stress. When it is negative, when those feelings of, right, that, that, that pulse that races and then therefore results in something like rumination or even avoidance. That's when we're going down that alley of something that could be physiologically negative as opposed to propelling us toward a positive response. So oftentimes when we work with anxiety, what also will show up is this desire to attach to it. So when we think that we can fix it, when we, by just worrying about it, <laughs> when we create a pattern around this bad or negative stress, and we can't really see a way around it, and or we think we're being productive by continuously focusing on it, we're only being productive when the outcome is different. So I'll say that again, if the outcome is the same, if it is over and over, such as in rumination, or if the outcome is we're not creating some kind of catalyst for change, that's when it can negatively affect our physiology and our body's hormonal response to it. When we are vulnerably expanded as opposed to contracted. So how do we do some of that? So there's a lot of coping strategies, of course, and uh, one of my favorite, I've just mentioned, <laughs> um, uh, I mentioned avoidance. Um, that is often a common strategy for anxiety. In other words, we're aware that something is making us anxious, but instead of wanting to sit with it for a moment to see if it will change, we sort of just hover around and helicopter around trying to either be overly busy. Um, often busyness is, is a form of avoidance. And anxious feelings. And so if we're constantly helicoptering and pushing those sensations away, 
And we aren't necessarily inviting change. So you probably heard that, um, uh, that phrase, you know, the only way, uh, the only way to write your destination is through, not necessarily around it. And avoidance is saying, oh, it's not there or I'll, or I'll just do all of these other things <laughs> and that'll make it go away when it actually typically doesn't. So I would have you imagine with me, this is a Jackson Pollock painting. If you could picture or imagine your anxiety as if it were a Pollock painting. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to settle here. Notice what it's drawn to. Is there a particular color? This is not what we normally do when we're feeling anxious. We don't actually sit with it. Look at the various experiences that we're having. So imagine that you're taking whatever it is you're anxious about today and you've splattered it into this painting. So maybe the yellow shows up as um, some sadness for you. Maybe the blue is your tiredness. The busyness of the painting is this trembling or this rapid heart rate. Now imagine that you've stepped outside of the painting and that you're just observing it. Are there new patterns that show up for you? New colors that come out that maybe you didn't see before? What if you could put a frame around the painting so you truly are just observing the work of art that is you? So we are not anxiety. We are not stress. These experiences, emotions, sensations happen to us. But that is not who we are. So taking this moment now to take a really wide view of the painting. And softening your gaze toward it offering all of these emotions a sense of compassion. One of the antidotes to anxiety is compassion and kindness. And I'll offer one more tool to this meditation is creating a phrase that counteracts this sort of inner critic, this inner judgment that we sometimes have. Oh, I should be able to handle all of this. So an antidote to that might be, we all struggle. Oh, I, I, I don't know why I can't get it right. I'm not, I just, I, I really wanna get to, I want it to be perfect. I know if I do it, it'll be perfect. The antidote to that would be nobody's perfect. I feel like I can't, can't quite get it right. I'm always working and working and working and throwing myself into it and I'm not getting anywhere. Well, the antidote to that would be telling yourself you're proud of yourself for trying. 
for getting up every day and trying again. Allow yourself to take just a few more breaths here. Noticing how your relationship after looking at this painting for so long can change and shift by just spending time with it. Notice how it is different. You can bring your attention back to the screen. So one of the other coping strategies that we tend to use, I call STURB, <laughs> which is called, um, and then this comes from the Grief Recovery Handbook, which I highly recommend is, um, been a beautiful process for me when I went through this about uh, five or so years ago. And STURBs stand for short-term energy relieving behaviors. And so whew, why this was so impactful to me is because I realized one of my strategies for anxiety was trying to do something to really quickly fix it. And something that wasn't necessarily sustainable. So some examples of that might be really anything that provides short-term relief. Food, you know, when I deserve this bowl of ice cream. <laughs> when I know like an hour later, my stomach doesn't really like um, milk. <laughs> and it's just not going to bring joy to my stomach. And I'm going to feel probably worse. Um, alcohol, you know, one glass, but a whole bottle, maybe not even exercise when done to excess. So remember things in moderation, right, are helpful and healthy and useful. But when we take things over the top, fantasy. So that whole Netflix and chill, <laughs> yes, in moderation. But when we do it to avoid, when we do it to not feel what's happening from the neck down, those are when those stirbs or those short-term energy relievers are not helpful for us. I mean, I could go on and on. Isolation, uh, again, too much of too much is not good, right? Um, sex, shopping, retail therapy, workaholism, throwing ourselves fully in. These are all things that can make anxiety exasperated in us. So what can we do instead of these short-term fixes? It's really the hard work of being present with the things that pop up for us. So when anxiety begins to well, what does that feel like for you in your body? Is it that heart rate elevated? Is it the breath staying right up on top? Is it maybe beginning to sweat or your hands get cold or maybe they get too hot? What do you notice physiologically coming up in the body? And how can you pause for a moment to be with it. The hardest thing about anxiety is the antidote to it is actually being with it. So we'll do another mindfulness exercise. And this is similar to when we, I think we did a few weeks ago of head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Um, this is feet, hands, and either heart or head. So I'm gonna go with my heart today. So you can sit however you like. If in fact, if you've been sitting for a long time and you wanna stand up and kind of walk around your room or just move a little bit, um, sometimes it feels good to change 
um, movement can bring about also a physiologically change for us as well. Take your eyes just slightly off of the computer and let your eyes become a downward gaze. So you can either look at the floor or you can close the eyes. And so take a moment to just tune into your feet. You might even wiggle them. You could brush them across the floor. You could even tap them. Notice by just a, some gentle movement that maybe some sensations arrive. Notice what those sensations are. Are they a tingle, a pulse? Feels like maybe circulation. Do they feel heavy or light? Do they feel dense? or spacious? Do they feel stiff or mobile? So just noticing the feet. And allow yourself to just take a full exhale. And one more time. And then let your attention float towards your hands. You can take the hands and you can rub them together. You can clasp them. You can make a fist and then relax them. Notice with that gentle movement, does it create a sensation in the hands? Is there a tingle, an increase in circulation or blood flow? Do they feel again tight? or soft, rigid, mobile, soothing, heavy, light. Can you just by noticing the hands relax them a little bit further? So if you were gripping unknowingly, is there a softness now that has arrived? And then allow yourself to exhale fully there. We're gonna move internally. So if it's helpful to place your hand on your heart, you can do that. You can also just simply imagine diving deep inside. In fact, the next breath that you take in, locating the space around the heart. Sometimes I find it really helpful to kind of lift my elbows and let my arms float away from me a little bit and then exhale. And I imagine that what I'm doing is expanding my heart from the inside out and then just allowing it to soften in the space around my chest. So if I can't feel internally a heartbeat or a sense where my heart is, then I imagine that my arms almost become like the wings or the valves of the heart. And then I can expand and contract as my heart does pumping and moving blood through my body. And this space around the heart and this beautiful organ in and of itself is vital and autonomic. You do not control the heart. The heart does its work for you. It assists in your blood pressure, your circulation, autonomically controlling, releasing all of the things that need to happen in your body is assisted by the heart. And you do not control it. It is your body's gift to you.
If you're able to tune in a little further, see if you can notice any pulsing in your body, whether you feel it in the hands, the feet, you could even take your hand to the carotid artery in your neck and notice if you can feel or find a pulse. And when you're ready, you can exhale all the way out. Bringing your attention back. Noticing when you are locating physical feelings and sensations in the body, were you making a list of things to do? <laughs> were you ruminating on the past or the future? Now, some of us might have been, and it takes a little coaxing to come back there. But for the most part, when you're able to pull that anchor into the body, either externally with hands, feet, or internally, noticing what we would call interoception, or being able to feel from the inside out, we even use that idea of finding the heart rate in the carotid artery. You can also find it um, in the wrist. Um, you can often find it in the belly. But noticing, and here's the PowerPoint with finding the heart rate and the heartbeat. The only way to slow that is through the breath. But you do not control the heart itself. It beats without your command. It is such a beautiful reflection to know anxiety and that big piece of anxiety is often control. We try to control what is uncertain. We try to control the uncontrollable. And yet we have to acknowledge there are many things that are outside of our control even our own heartbeat. And if we can rest in that, if we can be present with what we're experiencing, it may not take away the anxiety, but it can dial it down. And at the end of the day, that is what I hope these tools do for you. You can imagine it like a stereo knob. If I can just turn the volume down enough to listen to my experience, then I have more agency than I thought I did. And the beauty of that is incredibly powerful. Another aspect that we often don't think about um, with anxiety, there's a, there, it's close cousin is self-judgment. And in the meditation we did earlier, we created a frame when we were looking at the Pollock painting, we created a frame or a, or a sentence that is an antidote to that self-judgment. So if you can think of maybe a sentence that you often repeat to yourself in the negative, is there a way that you can reframe that toward the positive? in a way that's healthy and useful for you, not in a way to sugarcoat it or to try to pretend it's, it's any different than it is, but in a way that is helpful and healthy. So for example, what I always ask, there's two questions, is this true? So when I'm going down my anxiety trail, and I'm feeling really frustrated and I just throw myself into work or school or, and these thoughts that come up to mind, I like, when am I ever going to get done? I feel like I can't get done. I don't know how this, I'm going to, you know, da, 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 da. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. So that, that when am I ever, how am I ever, right? Is that true? No, it's not true because the project will end, the work will stop, 
these things will come to completion. The situation you're in will not stay the same. So is this true? And the next question I ask, is this useful? Sometimes that motivation to get something done or that little pick of right good stress is good for us. It propels us into action, into change, into doing something different. When it is not useful, right? When we go into an unhealthy or a negative right connotation toward it, then what shift can I make that can turn that anxiety into a tool for good? Sometimes it's just simply that pause that we create so that we can assess what's happening in our body and make some gentle changes and shifts. Sometimes it is taking a new action or a different action. I mentioned STIRBS earlier, the short-term energy relieving behaviors. Um, those can often be helpful as a resetter. When they're not helpful is when we use them to keep the anxiety going. In other words, when we use them to avoid or we use them to ruminate. So if those short-term energy relieving behaviors propel us to shift or to transform the anxiety, it's helpful. If instead it perpetuates the anxiety, then it's not. Let's go to another um, meditation. And, and this one is um, anchoring in, present, in the present moment. So again, you can take your eyes just slightly off the screen if you like, you can close them, you can move just a little bit, whatever feels right for you. And as you are breathing in and out, Imagine that your breath is a color. Maybe you can pick your favorite color. Mine is green. Yours might be blue of the ocean. It could be yellow. That resembles happiness. It could be that soft, soft, uh, pink or purple as in a sunset. So just allow yourself to imagine the breath as a particular color. If you can't see it in your mind's eye, you could open your eyes and find that color in your room and focus on the color. And as you breathe in and out, imagine that color expands and contracts with the breath. we're going to change the breathing pattern again. So this time you're going to breathe in and pause at the end breath and then take another sip of air without exhaling. And then exhale all the way out. And you'll do that again. Breathe in to feel like you're at the ceiling of the inhale, but keep going one more. And then let all of that go releasing. One more time, it's called a double inhale and a full exhale. So breathing in until you feel like you're at the ceiling. And again, and then complete exhale. And then just sort of pausing in that moment of that color that you can either see in your mind's eye or with your eyes. And noticing any physiological changes, are the shoulders softer? Is the space between your eyebrows a little softer? Do you notice a desire to swallow or to sigh? When you're ready, you can gently open your eyes. So we did two anchor points with that particular practice. One was color. 
So when we are looking or imagining something, it's very much a present moment, right? So we first exercise we did was you pick something to look at and anchor and tether ourselves to. This time I suggested a particular color. What we're seeing in this moment is our current moment experience. So you're looking at a screen, you're engaging here, present moment. When we add the breath to that, right? So you're actually changing neuro neurologically in your brain, two things at once. So we're focused on a color, we're focused on a breathing pattern and that in and of itself stops, right? The anxious list making, the, the, um, the feelings of anxiety or the symptoms that anxiety sometimes brings. So it, it's really, really difficult to do multiple layers of the anxiety at the same time. So it really brings us back to the present moment. And then last, we notice what was happening physiologically. And when we do that, when we sit with that, it allows us to dissipate or to dissolve some of those symptoms. So take a moment to just notice how it felt for you. Um, oftentimes as we come together, I'll ask you to have kind of a pen and paper handy, and this might be a, a good opportunity to do two things. One, jot down a practice that we did today that seems like a practice you might want to continue. So our theme today with anxiety was this idea of an anchor. So you could jot down the word anchor if that resonated with you. Maybe the STURBS resonated with you, the short-term energy um, relievers, relieving behaviors, um, but in a positive way. So if there's one that you tend to, to go to that you know that relieves some, the symptoms of, of anxiety, you could jot that down. We also looked at a painting, an art, for me, art is so powerful. The average individual looks at a piece of artwork, whether it's a Jackson Pollock or whether it's their grandchild's art for less than 10 seconds. That's an incredibly short time to appreciate something that is beautiful or interesting or challenging. Right, art can often stir up a lot of emotions in us, but as we spend time with it, just like if we spend time with our emotions, it changes. It might even look different the longer we look at it. And then we are different the longer we look at it and notice it. So art is another technique. And the last thing, um, one that, that I find really powerful is anchoring to a color. Um, it could be an object and also that double inhale and single exhale. So when we take that breath in, and then when we think we're at the top, we breathe in a little bit more and then allow the expiration of breath. It's actually, right, um, there's science to it. Your diaphragm is a muscle. And when that muscle is only expanded just part way, it really doesn't have the opportunity to continue to strengthen. By taking a fuller inhalation, it allows for a fuller and more complete expiration of breath. You're working that diaphragmatic muscle. The diaphragm is the second pump to the heart. When you are expanding through the diaphragm, you are also working the heart. And so we talked about the heart also being this muscle, which is autonomic, and yet we can change the pattern through our breath. Let's do one final um, uh, simple, simple exercise uh, for anchoring today. Um, so again, just eyes just slightly off the screen, if you will. And that, of course, reduces some of that visual stimulation. But this time we're going to add, and, and we did this a little bit with the other exercise we did of, of feet, hands, and heart. So 
taking just a gentle scan of your body. So just kind of noticing what's happening for you today. Maybe you notice some tension in your neck. You might notice maybe something in your jaw, maybe some shoulder stuff, maybe some hip stuff today. So just scanning the body and noticing what you notice. Is it arriving in the form of tension or spaciousness? Is it in the arriving in the form of pain or achiness? Or maybe no sensation at all? And then allow yourself to go just a little bit deeper. So let's say tension arrived around your shoulders. So consider, consider asking yourself what you would like to have happen. So if there's tension, well, I'd like to relieve that tension. So I'm gonna lift my shoulders. And as I exhale, I'll lower them down. If I'm feeling crankiness in my hips or pelvis, then I might round the pelvis in the back and then move the pelvis just a little bit side to side and just notice what that does. So the first action is to notice what is present, what is going on in the body, and then just simply asking with curiosity, what would you like to have happen there? And so by combining awareness, movement, gentle, subtle, doesn't need to be big. It can be very, very small. It could be a roll or a movement of the neck or could even be a sigh. And then noticing if there are any small incremental shifts, like that volume button or knob. Can you dial it down just a little? And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So mindfulness is a tool for training in attention. When we train our attention, it means that we're not ignoring, avoiding, or ruminating, but we can meet it with a sense of curiosity and compassion. So that is my hope for you today as we close our time out. And I'm really curious if you'd like to add in the chat box, perhaps maybe one practice that feels like it might be useful for you to revisit later today or this week. I'll offer you, you know, I suggested writing it down is helpful because later on today, You'll be like, I have no idea what we did. <laughs> I don't remember any of it. The other thing that you can do is when we finish here is to phone a friend. Share with them maybe one thing that really resonated with you, even if it's just a shift in how you felt, because that's what will enable you to come back to it. So a few things that folks say they're going to work on is breath work, anchoring, imagining your breath, exhaling in colors. Perfect. Beautiful. Yeah. Slow down and think those, those stirbs. Anchoring. Perfect. So as we wrap up our time together, I'll be sending out, oh, I love that questioning. Is this true? That's a big one for me. I'll be sending out all of the links to each one of our talks that we've done together. You'll find them on our YouTube um, link. Um, and you'll also have um, a survey, which will be so helpful. So even if you're watching this 
Um, later on, what I would love to know is how this has impacted you um, uh, and any suggestions for doing something slightly different or better. I would love to know that. Um, always hoping to improve and, and to shift and change. You can find us and our other programs at caregiverwellnessretreat.com. And of course, with a lot of gratitude to thank AARP for being able to offer this to all of you um, at no cost. I'm going to go ahead and I'll turn off our recording.